Hello and welcome to this class. This is week three and the unit we'll be talking about today is Ancient Ebla. Uh, this is for the course Ancient History, Ancient Near East and Ancient Greece. My name is Dr. Neil Silgi and I welcome you to this class. So let's get started with Ancient Ebla. So we're going to start this week uh, talking about a city in the region of northern Mesopotamia, northern Syria region, uh, known as Ebla. It was a legendary city north of the Euphrates and the capital of an important ancient kingdom. It appears to have developed around the same time as the regions of Akkad and Sumer, uh, with the earliest dates being as far back as 3500 BCE. We know that there was contact and trade from other civilizations like Sumer, like Akkad, and Egypt, with artifacts from all of these regions being discovered at the Ebla site. Within discoveries at the Eblis site are lists of trade agreements from kingdoms that actually are now lost to history. Now, before the 1970s, Ebla was also one of those lost kingdoms. There was only two pieces of evidence that this kingdom had ever, ever existed. The first was an inscription in the Egyptian city of Karnak in Upper Egypt. And the inscription is from around 1550 BCE and mentions the ruins of the city of Ebla. Now, in the summer of 1962, Paolo Mattia, a young Italian archaeologist, surveyed the plains of northwestern Syria and wasn't quite sure what he would find. The interior of Syria was considered archaeologically poor at the time, yet from excavations begun two years later at, at Tel Mardik, about 40 miles south of Aleppo, there would emerge what many consider to be the most important archaeological find of the 20th century. Now, I want to note that Paolo Mattia is no longer a young man, but he is teaching a course on the website Coursera on the archaeology of Ebla. So if you have any interest in delving deeper into the archaeology of Ebla, which is fascinating. Now, it's sponsored by the University of Rome, and it is in English. So if anyone wants to learn more about Ebla, please take the time and, and take a look at that site, because uh, he has lived his life dedicating himself to the study of this site and has a great deal of wealth to offer there. Uh, back to our, our lecture. Ancient inscriptions really attest, they attested to the existence of a city named Ebla. However, no one knew under which of the many names or mounds scattered throughout the Middle East the city might be found. They just weren't sure. One text told of the victory of Sargon, king of Assad, over Mari, Yarmuti, and Ebla. In another description, the Sumerian king Gudea mentioned the precious timbers that he received from the mountains of Ibla or Ebla. The name Ebla, as I already mentioned, also appeared at Karnak, Egypt, in a list of ancient cities that Pharaoh, Pharaoh Thutmose III conquered. 
so you can understand why archaeologists had tried to find Ebla. Further excavations, though, really had proved fruitless. In 1968, part of a statue of Ibit Lin, a sovereign of Ebla, was revealed. And it bore a votive inscription in the Akkadian language, revealing that it had been dedicated to the goddess Ishtar, who it is said to have shone in Ebla. And these archaeological finds began to reveal a new type of Semitic language, a, a new history that had been lost, and a new culture that we knew virtually nothing about. And finally then, confirmation that Tel Mardik corresponded to ancient Ebla came in the 1974-1975 archaeological season, with the discovery of cuneiform tablets that repeatedly bore the ancient name of Ebla. Excavations also showed that the city had had at least two lives. After a first period of influence, it had been devastated, and then Ebla was rebuilt, only to be devastated again and to fall into centuries-long oblivion and being lost. So we have this one city, but we have many histories to try to make sense of with the ancient city of Ebla. Uh, this city of Ebla was built on alluvial plains, uh, just like those that had been built uh, throughout the, the regions of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And because of that, very extensive agricultural uh, communities were possible. And it seems that the name Ebla means white rock. So if you've ever been to Vancouver, just think of the city south of Vancouver, British Columbia, White Rock, and that'll help you to remember this city of Ebla. And the term White Rock refers to really to the limestone substrate uh, that the city seems to have been built upon. So Ebla is built upon this white limestone, and it becomes part of the buildings. Uh, the site was evidently chosen because the limestone layer really guaranteed the presence of a good natural water supply. It was very easy to build cisterns and to ensure that uh, you could find access to major rivers. Uh, the precipitation level in the Ebla era really kind of limited real extensive cultivation uh, to things like cereals and vines and olive trees. And the area was also suitable for raising livestock like sheep. And it seems that there was uh, a large hinterland populations around Ebla that really kind of supported the urban area. Ebla's strategic position as well between the Mesopotamian plain and the Mediterranean coast really favored trade in timber. Uh, things like semi-precious stones and metals. And so there was lots of access to resources for the people of Ebla. The city dominated a region inhabited by some 200,000 people, it seems. And it's estimated that up to 10% of those 
lived in this capital city of Ebla. So it's a fairly large city with a very extensive hinterland community around it. The remains of a great palace that was found also testify to the grandeur of a phase of Eblaite civilization. Um, now, there was a portal that people would have to pass through that was very impressive in order to access this palace. And this, this portal was 15 to, uh, around 15 meters high. So, very impressive structure to be able to walk into this palace. And the palace had even been enlarged over the course of time to make way for some of the growing needs of a very, it seems to be, very powerful administration. And it seems that officials worked under a very complex hierarchy where the king and his consort were aided by uh, a whole layer of lords and elders. Now, here's one of the fascinating things. More than 17,000 clay tablets and, and different fragments of tablets have been found here. Originally, there was probably around 4,000 complete tablets, and these were placed on wooden shelves. And at some time, there was a fire. And what it seems to have happened is those wooden shelves were burnt up. And all these clay tablets were heated up by this fire. And that hardened them and made them permanent. And they collapsed down right where they had been stacked which preserved them almost perfectly for thousands of years. And what these tablets do is they reveal documents that give evidence of a very, very vast trade system with an Ebla. For example, the city did business with Egypt, as shown by the royal symbols of two pharaohs. The tablets were written mainly in Sumerian cuneiform, but some were in uh, what is now called Eblaite, which is a, a very ancient Semitic language that we, we can now decipher thanks to these documents. Um, researchers were really surprised to discover such an old Semitic language. Uh, and you may find it interesting that some tablets contain bilingual Sumerian Eblaite lists. And really what we have here is um, the first bilingual dictionary. And so it, it, it has a word and then it has the explanation in the other language. And so that helps for a lot of translation, which is wonderfully helpful. Uh, evidently, Ebla was also a significant military power. Uh, they've excavated carvings that depict Eblite warriors in the act of executing their enemies. Uh, and presenting severed heads, for example. And yet, Ebla's splendor ended when its history intersected with that of the rising powers of Assyria and Babylon. So it, it is not easy to trace those events exactly, but it seems that first, Sargon I, and we talked about him last week, and then his grandson Naram Sin, who we mentioned as well and wasn't a very nice guy, they moved against Ebla. And the archaeological evidence shows that the encounters were very violent 
and the raids were extremely ferocious. Now, as I mentioned, though, after a time, the city rose again and even gained importance within the region. The new city was constructed according to a very precise plan, accentuating its grandeur. Uh, in the lower city was a sacred area uh, dedicated to the goddess Ishtar, also viewed as a, a fertility goddess of the Babylonians. And you may have heard the famous Ishtar Gate uh, uncovered in the ruins of Babylon. Uh, a particularly imposing building at Eblis seems to have been used to house lions as well uh, that seem to have held a sacred meaning associated with the goddess Ishtar. And so this was all very fascinating. Now, when the royal palace of Ebla was discovered under a pile of rubble in the 1970s, its archives were found to house an enormous amount of correspondence, uh, some of which mentioned Syrian and northern Mesopotamian states, which we didn't even know existed before this. Kings and other representatives made offerings to Ebla's sanctuaries, to Ebla's diplomatic um, powers, and there was even records of diplomatic marriages that were concluded. Uh, there's records of wars that were fought. Um, and particularly, there was a, seems to have been a long-running conflict with Mari, uh, which is further to the south. Uh, the archive consisted, as I mentioned, uh, around 15,000 cuneiform tablets uh, mostly written in Sumerian. About 20% of them were written in, in Eblite. So, this region founded 50, or sorry, 3000 BCE. Um, if you were to put it on a map today, it's about 55 kilometers from uh, uh, Aleppo, and just want to kind of walk through a little bit of uh, part of the conflicts that took place uh, seem to also have been have caused the independence of Ebla to have been. Uh, eroded significantly by the kingdom of Mari. Uh, and then a, a local dynasty under Eberu freed the city from Mari and was probably responsible for creating its golden age during which a lot of this correspondence was written. So we're talking now around 2250 BC. Uh, Nothing is really known about the earliest kings up until around 2400 BCE, other than their names. And uh, just a list of, of a few of the names from Eblite tablets. King Aberlim, King Agurlim, King Ibidamu, uh, King Baduma, King Anardamu. King Ishar Malik, and King Kum Damu, and King Adub Duma. At around 2400 BC, Iblil II of Mari is credited with conquering Ebla, um, and as well as uh, another city, Haran which was uh, a subject of Ebla. Between this date and around 2250 BCE, the city reached its peak of achievement and development. The Eblaite, here's something really fascinating that they did. The Eblaites 
elected a local merchant ruler as their king. Now, some scholars will dispute this, uh, with some preferring to use the term minister. Um, you can really think of it in terms of like a president. Um, and very much like uh, a president of Russia or of the U.S., uh, because the term of office was limited to lasting only seven years. So the names of the three known merchant kings match with those which are sometimes ascribed to the Awan kings of Elam. So if they are one and the same, perhaps the elections were nothing of the kind. We're not sure. So uh, there is some question there. Now, around 2334 BCE, Ebla was devastated by the Akkadian Empire. So we probably have, this is probably where Sargon um, who states that he passed through Mari and used it as a base of operation in his campaign to the west. So he doesn't mention Ebla specifically, but he does talk about conquering the region as well as his grandson Nerim Sin, who also claims specifically to have conquered Ebla. Uh, now, Egyptian pottery seals listing Pepe uh, I are among the debris at this time. Now around 2250 BCE, uh, being one of the states which revolted against Naram Sin of Agad, Ebla is conquered in order to subdue it, ending really its golden age. So we kind of have in that time period uh, the reason for this happening. Now, we actually know quite a bit. So from the discovery seals, uh, they bear the name uh, of someone who seems to have been the daughter of Naram Sin, who was the object of a diplomatic marriage, probably to Ebla's ruler. And Ebla is really able to regain some economic importance in the region, but it doesn't return to its former levels of glory. It's possible that the city has economic ties with other cities in the area that really kind of help it to continue and sustain itself. Now, from a, as the Akkadian Empire collapses, uh, Ebla falls under the control of what is known as the Third Dynasty of Ur. And this is around the time of Abraham uh, in the book of Genesis in the Bible. So around this time, uh, 2000 and 1900, uh, Ebla is one of the northern states to, to really kind of survive the downturn of the region and, and uh, this whole region suffers fairly significantly economically, and, and it's noted within Genesis, interestingly enough, that that's part of the reason why Abraham moved, was um, environmental problems. Um, there was a famine in the land. So this all seems to fit fairly well with uh, the what we see with the phases of the history of Ebla. Around 1900 BCE, with the end of the dynasty of generals, um, Ebla falls under Amorite control. Uh, with about 50 years uh, before it, it really kind of regains a little bit of prosperity, and that prosperity then lasts until about 1600. So there's a significant economic downturn around 1900, and then it seems to rise again in prosperity to about 1600. But then we see that it 
runs into trouble again and, and we have a pillar from Karnak in Upper Egypt that ascribes uh, to uh, conquest of Ebla to Thutmoses the third and we'll talk about him a little bit later on uh, this week and next and then finally that kind of puts the nail in the coffin for Ebla remaining as a powerful city uh, from 1400 to 900 uh, we see the city fall under Aramean control, which they exercise power over this whole region of Syria. And Ebla never really recovers from uh, the downturn that took place around 1600 and from the apparent conquest by Thutmosis III. And it really kind of steadily declines from that point and it, it remains uh, a small village essentially uh, for the next thousand years actually the next 1700 years it's just a small minor village and then finally the site is abandoned uh, in the seventh century so um, it's one of these places that goes through times of great grandeur and then decreases down slowly more and more until finally it just kind of gives up the ghost. Now part of Ebba's prosperity uh, seems to have stemmed from the agricultural hinterland. Uh, it was relatively rich plain of northern Syria. So the cereals, uh, barley, wheat, as well as being able to grow olives, figs, grapes, pomegranates, flax as well. Um, there was seemed to have been good resources for cattle, for sheep, for goats, and for pigs. Uh, beyond all of this, Ebla also controlled a group of 17 city-states at its height. And these extended around the area of Lebanon all the way up to southeastern Turkey. And they also seem to have been rich in both silver and in timber. And in fact, they were quite well known for the quality of the, of the timber that came from there. And the city proper was a manufacturing and a distribution center. There seems to have been uh, linen and wool, including... Uh, specialty cloths that were really the main products of Ebla. And so, you know, this is just shows how profoundly important having uh, these business documents, these clay tablets that were preserved, give us such a strong insight into the, the life of Ebla. Also, metalworking, uh, including the smelting of alloys like gold and silver and copper and tin and lead was also a fairly significant activity, not quite so important as uh, linen and wool and cloth, but still very significant, and as well as woodworking and the production of olive oil, of wine and beer also seemed to have been important. So they had a fairly diversified economy. And the trade was really a third support of Ebla's economy. So we have cloth, so we have these manufactured goods and the olive oil, which were the main exports. And then they have imports, including gold and silver and copper and precious stones and sheep. Uh, and because of its geographic location, Ebla really grew wealthy on transit trade. Materials from Iran and Anatolia and Cyprus were shipped to states as distant as Sumer in Egypt. And the Egyptian trade passed through this region. Diplomacy and limited warfare supported Ebla's commercial activities. Amar, a city strategically located um, 
on the Euphrates River was tied to Ebla by di dynastic marriage. Kamazi was Ebla's commercial and political uh, ally in Iran, that far away. Uh, commercial treaties were drawn up with other cities. Uh, Mari on the Euphrates River to the southeast was Ebla's great commercial rival, and twice Eblaite armies marched against it. And for a time, Ebla, as we've already mentioned, was ruled through a military governor from Mari. Or, sorry, Ebla ruled Mari through a military governor. So it kind of, the power went back and forth. Mari ruled Ebla for a while. Ebla ruled Mari for a while. Um, and as I mentioned, there was a tradition in Ebla to not have non to, to have non-hereditary kings gover govern Ebla for a limited period of time. And they also seemed to have a council of elders that shared in the decision-making process. So the government seems to have been very complex and, you know, almost it seems to be like a, the modern-day American government. Uh, the manufacture of cloth was under the queen's charge. Fourteen governors appointed by the king ruled Ebla's departments, so they were departmental ministers of the government. And two of these ministers were responsible for running the government, uh, the, the, the city itself, and the rest uh, in charge of other regional industries and political activities. Now, the religion of Ebla was very polyistic uh, and primarily Canaanite. Uh, Debir was the city's patron god, but gods like Dagon that um, was very popular for the next, uh, during this time, all the way down south, was very popular. The Philistines, for example, worshipped Dagon. Uh, other gods like Sabish, Hadad, Balatu uh, were also worshipped. Uh, the language of Ebla is a Canaanite type of dialect. Uh, it's closely akin to Northwestern Semitic languages, but it wasn't really known. Uh, the script of the tablets uh, with the Sumerian cuneiform um, is also close to tablets that have been found uh, in different regions of Iraq. It, the text also reveals that Sumerian teachers came to Ebla to teach. And the presence of a canal of Ebla near Adab attests that Eblaites went to Sumer as well. So the vocabularies, the syllabaries, the gazetters, and student exercises have all been recovered uh, in Ebla, and they show that Ebla was a major educational center. It, it, it's just the completeness of Ebla text is just absolutely astounding. And it points uh, to a strong connection with Sumer. And this really enhances even, so the Eblaite uh, texts even give us insight into what was going on in Sumer. Now, um, there are a few things that are, are rather fascinating as well. And, and um, scholars point out many things that are similar between Ebla and what we have in the book of Genesis. And that does make a lot of sense because... Uh, the things that are occurring in the book of Genesis really pass right through Ebla. They, they are to the east of Ebla, and then they're to, to the south of Ebla and the west of Ebla. 
So it, it makes perfect sense that there should be this overlap. Uh, some things that are similar. Now there isn't any any mention to the events in Genesis in the Ebla text, but that wouldn't be logical because the book of Genesis is largely about the story of a family. Um, but there are some language similarities. Uh, common personal names are similar between Genesis and Ebla texts. Uh, there's similar Semitic words, and that makes sense as well, since Hebrew is a Semitic language and Eblite is a Semitic language. Uh, one thing that is fairly significant, I think, is that uh, Ebla mentions cities that are also mentioned in Genesis. In fact, mentioning cities that Genesis purports to describe divine destruction of these cities. And I, that's just absolutely fascinating. We don't know exactly where these cities are, but the fact that we have two different sources that mention these cities, uh, two independent sources, is, is fascinating. Now, I don't want to make too big a deal out of it, but um, there is, for example, one of the personal, as I've mentioned before, um, one of the names for God in Genesis is El. And there is a uh, the mention of a name in Ebla texts that means who is like El. I think that's interesting. Um, there's also names in Ebla texts that are similar to names in Genesis. For example, Abraham. Uh, other names like Esau and Ishmael are also mentioned in Ebla texts. Um, other words uh, uh, for example, uh, one of the names of one of the Ebla kings has the name Malek. Uh, in Hebrew, Melech means king. Uh, elders in the city of Ebla, so that, that ruling council of elders, were called Abu. And that's scholars have noted that's strikingly similar to he Hebrew Abba for father or elder. So um, just highlighting some some Semitic connections between the, this Eblaite language and the Hebrew language as well. Now I don't want to make too big a deal out of it but it's just interesting to see these connections in geography and history. Uh, we'll stop there with uh, the lecture on Ebla and next we will be taking a look at Egypt and the different dynasties within Egypt.